this is episode six of Joel chapter three A, the first part. So Joel uh, quotes Obadiah. Here's Joel, and so therefore he lived after Obadiah. And Amos quotes Joel, and here's Amos. He quotes Joel. So he lived between these two, and he doesn't condemn idolatry or the Assyrians or the Babylonian invasions. So he wasn't that far away. He was here someplace. So here's a recap. You can uh, pause and read this if you want to. There's chapter 1a, first part, Judah's locust plague. 1b, second part, Judah must repent. Chapter 2a, Assyrian invaders. And chapter 2b, Yahweh responds to the Assyrian invaders. And you can pause and read this if you want to. Uh, the Lord's... He, uh, God's response is his answer, his outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and he establishes his kingdom on earth. So you can pause and read this. Joel is a three-pronged approach to the immediate day of the Lord. Chapter 1 was the immediate day of the Lord, which was the plague of locusts. Chapter 2 was the imminent day of the Lord, which was a threatening army. And chapter 3, the final day of the Lord, which is the battle of Armageddon. And this is the vengeance on nations. God judges the nation. So let's dive into chapter 3a, the nation is judged. So the New Testament regarding the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. But the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So Old Testament and New Testament spoke about this new day so nations prepare for judgment so in the Hebrew Bible we're in chapter 4 <clears throat> here we're in chapter 3 verse 1 in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem in those days and at that time this is the time of Israel's final redemption the regathering of Judah is a prerequisite for the end times this has been happening for some years now so the events of the end times have already started, moving us toward the time of the Great Tribulation. The primary theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. His is the first mention of this concept, and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel all refer to the day of the Lord. Zephaniah's reference is so obvious that he simply calls it that day. And at that time, two-thirds of the world population will die, about five billion people. Zechariah 13 says, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. The book of Revelation describes the Great Tribulation in epic detail from chapters 4 to 16. At that time, billions of unsaved people will die a horrible death. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Israel is God's promised land, and Jerusalem his chosen city. The end times is all about Israel, firstly bringing back all the Israelites that were sold into captivity over the millennia and scattered around the world, and secondly to bless Judah and its people as they are re-established in their land. God is aware that the recreation of the state of Israel will be a catalyst for war. Nations prepare for judgment. You have scattered my people. Verse 2, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and divided up the land. So I will gather all nations. Every nation in the entire world, Asia, Africa, the Americas, Europe, and Pan Pacific, everyone will be judged that stands in opposition to God's purposes, and they will be brought to a specific valley for judgment, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat means God judges, or commonly called the Valley of Judgment or the Valley of Decision. This is the only place in the Bible where this term appears. Some believe it is the place mentioned in 2 Chronicles 20, where in a historic victory, God defeated the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites that came out to fight Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. This is one possibility. Another possibility is when Zechariah 14 says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And Zechariah 14 says, In that day the Lord will stand on the Mount of Olives, and the mount shall be split in two, making a very large valley. Another possibility is the Valley of Kidron, which is full of grave sites. And the preferred possibility is the Valley of Jezreel, where the world armies will gather at Megiddo for the Battle of Armageddon. 
Hebrew scholars accept this is the valley referred to since Jezreel means God will plant. No one really knows, but ultimately it's an unresolved area where all the nations will be judged for their actions against Israel. Remember, Jesus is the Jewish King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it's likely this valley of Jezreel. I will put them on trial for what they did to my God. There I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people, my people, and my land. God uses my, which emphasizes his covenant relationship with Israel. God says it's my inheritance. An inheritance must be provided by someone, and in this case, it is God who provides. Because they scattered my people and divided up my land. He, the nations, have always coveted the promised land and have often divided it as spoils among themselves in, in history. Even in recent times, Israel itself divided their land in an exchange with the Arabs in their land for peace deal, when Israel partitioned their land and forcibly removed the Jews from Gaza, whereupon the Arabs moved in. And since then, Gaza has been a thorn in the side of Mars and Israel. So here's Gaza, and it, all of this was occupied by the Jews, and then uh, they gave up Land for peace is what the Arabs convinced them to do. They gave them Gaza, and they've done nothing but fight Israel since then. Now God is angry and emphasizes this again with my people, my land. Now God is getting involved, taking a stand for his covenant people. Nations prepare for judgment. So you've scattered my people and you've sold my children. Verse 3, they cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine to drink. They cost lots. Joshua divided the promised land by lot and gave each tribe an a portion of land, as God declared. Now the heathens offend the living God by dividing up the land and distributing the land as they see fit. The Israelites are treated as chattel, traded for sexual and drunken pleasures. This is highly offensive to God. They traded boys and sold girls. These were common atrocities of the pagan lands. Jewish boys sold into pedophile prostitution and Jewish girls exchanged for a cheap bottle of wine. Today we still have human trafficking, but now it's on a stunning global scale. Verse 4. Now what have you against me, Tyre and Sidon, in all your regions of Philistia? Are you repaying me for something I have done? Are you paying me back? I will swiftly and speedily return on your own heads what you have done. Now what have you against me? For the next four verses, verses 4 to verse 8, we're on verse 4 here. God is speaking directly to the nations, not about them. God had used the Gentile nations to discipline God's people, but they went way beyond discipline to pillaging and exploitation. God refers to the Jews as my people and to the region as my land. God is highlighting that heathen lands have no covenant relationship with him. God's covenant was with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his, their descendants. And his Mosaic covenant was with the people of Israel when they were delivered from Egypt. God does not have any covenant with, at all with heathen nations. Tyre and Sidon. These were the two main cities of ancient Phoenicia, from which they sold Israelites as slaves all over the world. Today, this region is modern Lebanon. So Phoenicia was over here. These, you can see their trade routes. I mean, these guys were busy, busy, busy. They were a seafaring nation. And this was the land routes, and these were the sea routes. And they, they took slaves, Jew, Jewish slaves, and when God says they scattered them amongst the nations, they really, really did. They scattered them all over. And God is offended. So, and he's especially offended with Tyre and Sidon, the two main cities of ancient, ancient Phoenicia. So here's Phoenicia up here. Regions of Philistia. So here's Philistia, here, the land of the Philistines. So modern Gaza occupies ancient Philistia, the land of the giants. The Philistines had often plundered Israel. In fact, they plundered Dan so often that eventually the tribe of Dan moved away from their land of inheritance to way up north, closer to Tyre. So this was Dan's original tribal land when Joshua um, just, uh, split up the land by lot. Um, this was Dan's land, and the Philistines still, I mean, that was, Judah was supposed to occupy Philistia as well, but, you know, it was difficult fighting the giants all the time. So, but the giants loved the stuff that Dan made, because Dan was the, um, given all, God gave them all the skills and the craftsmen skills. So they had good stuff, so the giants were always invading Dan. 
eventually Dan gave it up as a bad job and they moved way up here closer to Sidon and Tyre. Here's Tyre, here's Sidon, uh, the Phoenician land. And so they moved up here to get away from the Philistines. So, uh, so modern Gaza occupies the Philistine land area. And they moved up closer to Tyre here, Tyre and Sidon. So Phoenicia and Philistia. So this is Phoenicia, the land of the, the, the sailors, and Philistia, Philistines, the land of the giants, were both given to Israel by God as an inheritance when Joshua was dividing the promised land among the 12 tribes of Israel. They were instructed to drive the Canaanites from the land, but failed to fully conquer the region. God told them what to do, but their failure to do so at the time remains a headache for Israel today, thousands of years later. So God says, are you repaying me for something I've done? All the grievances that are committed on Israel, God takes personally. God sees them as committed on himself. The essence is that God is Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. In God's eyes, it is Israel on one side and all the nations on the other. God doesn't regard his Israel as one of the all nations. Israel stands apart. So it's Israel against the whole world. All through the scriptures, God considers Israel and its people as his. Later, God sent his son to save the world from their sin. So all believers in Jesus the Messiah are also grafted into God's vine, Israel. And we have become sons and heirs with Jesus. I will swiftly and speedily return on your own heads what you have done. Back in Genesis, God warned that what the nations do to Israel will be done to them, both good and bad. In Genesis 12, it says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So I, I would prefer the blessing part personally. So, nations prepare for judgment. You scattered my people, you sold my children, and you stole my finest treasures, the temple treasures. Verse 5. For you took my silver and my gold and carried off my finest treasures to your temples. My silver, my gold, my finest. God's very, very possessive. So I carried to your temples. God is a jealous God. As creator, he made it all. All the earth and its minerals. And he decides you can have what? Now the heathens have stolen God's precious temple treasures and used them for pagan purposes. Jeremiah, when you look at Jeremiah, Haggai, Hosea, Kings, I mean all these prophets said, Jeremiah 27 says, I have made the earth and the man and the beast that are on the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given to whom it seemed proper to me. Haggai 2 says, God reminds us, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And Hosea 2 says, God is angry at Israel for worshipping false gods. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold which they prepared for Baal, which is most offensive to God. False religions, God doesn't like those. These treasures went to Babylon in two kings, and we are told in Ezra that the Persians, Iran, gave them back under King Cyrus. Later the Romans stole them, and they are currently in the Vatican. Per the Jerusalem Post of February 10, 2022, there are several people alive that can personally attest to being eyewitnesses of the Vatican possessing temple vessels, including the menorah candelabra. The menorah from the second temple, here it is here, as depicted in this arch being carried by Romans on the arch of Titus. So this is actually on the wall of the arch of Titus. An inscription in the Colosseum boasts that the gold and silver stolen from Jerusalem by the Romans was used to pay for the construction of the arena in the city of Rome, where they threw Christians to the lions. But first the Vatican took the choicest pieces of God's treasures for themselves. Nations, prepare for judgment. You've scattered my people, sold my people, you've stolen my final treasures, and you trafficked my people. Verse 6. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks, that you might send them far from their homeland. You sold the people of Judah. The Jews were sold into the surrounding heathen nations and also into Europe. The purpose was to scatter the Jews far and wide to break them culturally. Ezekiel 27 laments about the trade relations with Tyre, the main city of Phoenicia. Jovan, Tubal and Meshach were your traders. They bartered human lives and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. It's a little boy being sold. So awful. We have it even today. 
and you sold them to the Greeks. Greek acquired 1,330,000 slaves. It was said that 10,000 slaves per day were sold at Delos. Per King Solomon, human trafficking was prohibited under the covenant between King Solomon and King Hiram of Tyre. So King Solomon knew that they loved selling people, that, that they trafficked in human, humanity. And so Israel and Phoenicia had no blood ties. So instead they had a relationship of brotherhood bond. This covenant had a special provision against human trafficking, especially in Jews. This ancient covenant was conveniently forgotten when Tyre got greedy and wished to sell the whole nation of Hebrew captives to Greeks and Edumaeans, which are the Edomites, whose cruelty and hate for the Israelites was well known. This was one term of the treaty the Phoenicians were never to break, according to King Solomon. And God was angry with Tyre when they did, and he punished them. Amos 1.9 says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Tyre, and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, not one or two people, but a whole tribe, and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, which shall devour its palaces. The Lord was so angry with the Phoenicians for trafficking in Jews that he swore to wipe out the magnificent city of Tyre. This happened twice, once under King Nebuchadnezzar, who besieged Tyre and enslaved the people, and again 240 years later when Alexander the Great in 332 BC utterly destroyed the city, such that there were few signs that it ever existed. Even today, the old town Tyre is a heap of stones where fishermen can spread their nets. Sit on. The sister city of Tyre suffered a similar fate. Imagine how magnificent this once was. Ezekiel 26 says, It shall be a place for spreading nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. It shall become plunder for the nations. And that's exactly what Alexander the Great did. Send them far from their homeland. The result of human trafficking is the selling of people and sending them to a different land as slaves, far from home. The Israelites were sent to Greece and to Edom, away from their promised land, where their worship of the one true God got mixed up with paganism. And God is a jealous God. So, since ancient times, the Jews have always had the one true God. And they stood apart as a, as a nation that only believed in one true God. All the other nations had literally thousands of gods. I mean, Egypt and places like that, thousands of gods. And, so, and the Romans um, had thousands of gods, hundreds of gods. Um, but the Jews stood apart as the culture with one true God. And so the heathen nations dispersed the Jews as far from the promised land as possible. If they can destroy the people and destroy their culture and destroy their worship of the one true God who seem to fight for them all the time, more than their silly gods than in their false religions, then perhaps they can destroy the nation and thereby God's purposes. If Satan, using heathen nations, can destroy Israel, then maybe he can prevent Jesus' second coming and prevent himself being tossed into the lake of fire for eternity. As though any man or Satan can defeat Almighty God. Revelation 20 And the devil who deceived the nations was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, nations prepare for judgment. You scattered my people, sold my people, stole my treasures, trafficked my people, and I will do unto you as you have been as you have done to my people. Verse seven. See, I am going to rouse them out of the places to which you sold them, and I will return on your own heads what you have done. The people weren't only taken into captivity as slaves, they were also bought and sold like, like livestock. I will return on your own heads. Again, God promises them, I will do to you as you have done to my people. Verse 8. To the people of Judah. To the people of Judah. And they will sell them to the Sabians, a nation far away. The Lord has spoken. So these are the Sabians down in modern Yemen down here. And so here's Jerusalem. And so the Jews were sold all over the world. Um, and God says, I'm going to sell, sell your people 
to the Sabians. And this is Ethiopia and Somalia on that side. So the Sabians were an ancient group descended from Ishmaelite stock. Remember Abraham's first, uh, first son, Ishmael? They lived in southern Arabia, which is modern Yemen. They were a people of stature, according to Isaiah 45, and a rival nation that raided Israel. Job 1 says, when his servant told Job that he had lost his livestock, he said, the servant said, when the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So the Phoenicians, which is Lebanon today, had sold Judah to the Sabians, and now God promises Tyre that their children will be sold into slavery to the Sabians. So Tyre is up here, higher up, and he's saying you know, that their children will be sold down here to the Sabians. So God promises Tyre that their children will be sold into slavery to the Sabians. Tit for tat, and God's people will triumph over their enemies. Obadiah 15 says, For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. Obadiah 18 says, The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau, which is the Edomites, shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So the, the Edomites lived around here. The bottom of, this is Israel, it's a little pale piece, and they lived around this bottom piece here in the desert. And here's the Sabians. And God says, you'll wipe out the Edomites. And he told the Phoenicians, you'll sell their children to the Sabians. So you don't want to get in front of an angry God. The justice of God demands that the injustice of men and nations toward each other must be re redressed. However, vengeance belongs to God. Romans 12. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, put away your anger, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord has spoken. So Matthew 7, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. In other words, you sold my children, I will sell yours. You made slaves of my people, I will make slaves of your people. You scattered my people, I will scatter yours to the land of the Sabians. The Lord has spoken. Nations, judgment, we finished that. Now we're on to nations, prepare for war. Warriors arise. Verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war, rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Prepare for war. This is a call to arms. Get ready. Declare a holy war. Prophetically, Israel must prepare for war. There will be a war sooner or later, and many wars in the last days. Looking backward, Joel made a similar call to the priests and people to repent when the locusts invaded their land. And once again, the people prepared for war when the Assyrians invaded their land. Looking forward to the final dreadful day of the Lord, the Great Tribulation period, at that time, the Antichrist will gather the vast armies of the world against Israel for the unsuccessful battle of Armageddon. Unsuccessful for the nations, not for Israel. Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Nations prepare for war. So the warriors arise and prepare for war. Now build your weapons. Verse 10. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. So we've got plowshares into swords and pruning hooks into spears. So God is challenging the surrounding nations to try their luck against Israel, which is preparing for war. Even the farmers turn their farming implements into warfare weapons. This is the exact opposite of other scriptures like this, where peace is wanted, not war. These prophets are speaking of the future millennium kingdom that is ushered in by Jesus' second coming. Isaiah 2 says, They shall beat their swords into plowshares. Here it's plowshares into swords. And their spears into pruning hooks. And here God is saying, make your pruning hooks into spears. And Micah says the same thing. Beat your swords into plowshares, spears into pruning, pruning hooks. So these two prophets are speaking about the millennium kingdom of peace, thousand years of peace. But Joel is talking, the peace of the kingdom of heaven is set up while war still covers the earth. Let the weakling say, I am strong. 
God says, come and attack if you can and see what the results will be for Israel's enemies. Let every man in Israel be enthusiastic for war, be encouraged to stand strong. Train everyone to be strong, to be warriors. Because they seek God's will and rely on God to protect them and defend them, so even weaklings can fight and say, I am strong. God's enemies are summoned to their last great confrontation with him. So prepare for war. Warriors arise, build your weapons, and assemble your army. Verse 11, come quickly all you nations from every side and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, Lord. Looking forward in time to the day of the Lord, Jesus will come to earth with his hosts of mighty angels to fight for Israel and defeat her enemies. Nations prepare for war, warriors arrive, build your weapons, assemble your army and advance to the valley of decision. Verse 12. Let the nations be roused, let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Nations are roused. These are the heathen nations being called to judgment. By heathen, I mean those that do not have a covenant relationship with God. So while your nation perhaps doesn't have a covenant relationship with God, if you're an individual, you do. Through Jesus Christ, you have a covenant relationship with God. So the nations be roused. These are the heathen nations being called to judgment, those without a covenant to God. Biblically, God will gather all the nations to that battlefield, the valley where Yahweh judges, to bring about the kingdom of God and his will for mankind. Here God will hand out his verdict on the wicked nations. Here God's heavenly decree will be executed against the gathered nations. So prepare for war. Warriors arise, build your weapons, assemble your army, advance to the valley of Jezreel and trample your enemies. Verse 13, swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes for the winepress is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. The harvest is ripe. There's a change now from war terminology to harvest terms. God judged wicked Israel with a locust plague, followed by the scorched earth policy of the Assyrians. Thus, there had been no harvest in Israel for some time, no agricultural harvest. But now in the final day of the Lord, the harvest is other nations that are ripe for judgment because of their great wickedness. Joel compares the battle to the harvesting of wheat with a sickle and trampling and crushing grapes. To God, this mighty battle of Armageddon will be as routine as any good harvest. Today, when someone is saved, we talk of the harvest of souls. Looking forward in time, Revelation speaks of Jesus swinging his sickle to harvest the souls of the wicked and their blood running four to five foot deep up to the bridle of horses. Revelation 14 says, Then I looked and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Come trample. The trampling of heathens takes place outside of Jerusalem. God does not allow his city to be violated again. The imagery here is God crushing and trampling Israel's enemies, and the heathen blood flows, just as people trample grapes to crush the juice out. Revelation 14. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. In multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. They are the valley of decision. Multitudes, multitudes. The word is first made plural with an S. And then the word is repeated for emphasis. In other words, the multitude is so massive, too great to count, an ocean of armies in this valley. The valley of decision. This is the Lord's time to decide what to do. It's not the people's time, nor the nation's. It's God's time to render his decision, his judgment. God will determine the outcome. He will hand down his verdict against the nation's. So I copied this picture here from this website, Cross to Victory. 
What I recommend is you go and watch a couple of YouTubes of the 23rd of September 2017. This happened, this cosmic alignment happened at that point. And that it has never happened in 7,000 years. So this cosmic aligning, alignment has not happened since Garden of Eden. And so it's, it's absolutely fascinating. This, this guy has a write-up, but there's lots of videos, YouTubes on it, where people have really terrific um, CGI and, and point out everything. And so that, that this is world history suggests about 70 years for the final generation, and I think it's 120 years because that's what God said he would give us after Noah. So there's a seven-year sign for World War Three, and if you take 27 plus 7, we get to 2024, um, and it very much looks like World War Three is in full swing right now. And here he says Adam lived 930 years, which is seven years, uh, 70 years short of his millennial, the thousand years of peace. And so he's saying that there's a seven-year sign for the fall confirmed by simple, chrono uh, by simple Bible chronolog chronology. So I would recommend just go and watch a few of them. You know, it does. I'm not saying any one of them is correct or, or the interpretation is correct. What I am saying is that this sign on this day showed up for the first time since the Garden of Eden. And when God shows us a sign, we should at least take note of it. And I've covered this all in my, my YouTube uh, playlist on, on Revelation. So nations prepare for war. Warriors arise, build your weapons, assemble an army, advance to the valley of decision and where you're going to trample the enemy. And there will be terrifying cosmic signs like these cosmic signs. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. Sun, moon, stars. Cosmic signs. Joel already warned us about this in chapter 2. And 900 years later, the Apostle John in 96 AD, writing the book of Revelation, is seeing the same apocalypse as Joel saw. They see the same event. Joel 2 says, the earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. This was in the previous chapter, chapter 2 of Joel. He says, sun and the moon grow dark. God created the heavens and the earth, and he decides how and when to draw our attention to his great works. In Genesis 1, then God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Revelation 6. is uh, John writing in 96 AD, writing the book of Revelation. He says, I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Moon becomes blood. When we see stunning cosmic signs, this is the announcement of the approaching end times. Then believers know that the rapture is near. The key sign is the sun turns dark. Not just a brief eclipse, but total black darkness. And the moon turns to blood. This is a different kind of cosmic sign to the typical eclipses and regular blood moons and occasional meteor shower. When the whole earth is in utter, maybe perpetual darkness, this is the sign of Jesus' second coming. Jesus, the light of the world. So this is uh, one of Chuck Misler's slides that I use in my uh, Revelation playlist. So we have uh, Daniel 69th and 70th week. So there's 69th week, and then there's this interval where Jesus is, uh, lives and dies on the cross. They burn the temple in 70 AD, the Romans do. And then this interval here carries on, carries on, and it's still carrying on like 2,000 years later. But at some point, we're going to have the pre-tribulation. People, some people go for the mid-tribulation and the post-tribulation, but there are a lot of issues, and there's not too much that, that can support that. But there's a lot that supports a pre-tribulation rapture. So the rapture happens, and then there's this period here from the rapture to the announcement of the Antichrist. And we don't know if that's a week or a day or a year or a month or whatever, that this little period from the rapture till the Antichrist is, is announced, we don't know how long that period is. But whenever it happens, then Revelation 6 to 19 starts. And it's the 70th week of Dan, uh, that Daniel talks about, 
when the Great Tribulation happens, uh, the abomination of des desolation. After the 70th week is Jesus' second coming and then a thousand years of peace, and then we are sent to heaven to spend eternity with heaven. There's the great white judgment over here, the white throne of judgment, at the end of the thousand years, and then we assemble, we are sent to go to heaven, and we spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. So this is when the sun goes absolutely dark. So the last time the world was in darkness, the angel of death moved through Egypt and killed all the Egyptian firstborn, human and animal. Only those that used the blood of the Passover lamb sprinkled on their door lintels was spared. They had the light of Messiah while Egypt was covered in darkness. So two deaths happened that night, the death of the Egyptian firstborn and the death of the Jewish Passover lamb. Exodus 12 tells us, And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. Why did God use ten plagues? Ten is the number of completeness. God could have delivered his people after one good plague, but he chose to do ten. Why? Because by the third plague, the Egyptian people started questioning their magicians. The Egyptians could see that in Goshen, life was unchanged. Here's Goshen, nice green part of the part of, of Egypt, a delta where it's nice and watered, and life's good in Goshen. Things were pretty good over there in Goshen. But in Egypt, there was one plague after another. The people knew, and the magicians knew, that this was not sorcery that the magicians could conjure up, but was the finger of God, the supernatural power of of Almighty God on full display. Goshen means to approach. It was the place where you could approach God. And the people in Egypt could plainly see, here are the plagues and there are none. So obviously some moved to Goshen. And thus a mixed multitude left Egypt after the 10th plague. This judgment is not the same as the great white throne judgment that takes place at the end of the thousand years of peace after the millennium kingdom and before our ascension to heaven. So I said that over here is the great white throne of judgment after the millennium of peace. So don't confuse that. So we've had the nations prepare for judgment, nations prepare for war, Judah prepare, prepare for war, and now nations prepare for defeat because God is your refuge if you're, Jew, if you're Jews. Verse 16, the Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. The Lord will roar. This is a messianic prophecy. The Lion of Judah will roar at his second coming, and his voice will thunder out of Jerusalem. You can buy this, this poster online. Thunder from Jerusalem. God dispenses his justice from within his holy city, from which he rules his inheritance. Thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble. At the sound of Messiah's voice, the heavens and earth will quake. So it's really interesting that at the sound of Messiah's voice, the earth will quake. Because, you know, when, when, uh, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and 400 Roman soldiers came to arrest him, I mean, there was 12 of them, God and his, uh, uh, Jesus and his disciples, and they sent 400 Roman soldiers to go and collect him. And when they came up to Jesus and they said, we're looking for Jesus, Jesus said, that I am I am he. Uh, just at the sound of Jesus' voice, the, 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 the Bible says the Romans fell back, which is like uh, we understand today to be sm smitten with the Holy Spirit, where they fall flat on the floor. So just at the sound of Jesus' voice saying, I am he, the, the Roman uh, soldiers all fell down. Well, not dead, but they all fell down in, uh, under the Holy Spirit, under the voice of Jesus. So at the sound of Messiah's voice, the heavens and earth will quake. Revelation has graphic details on how the earth will tremble and quake during the end times. And not just ordinary earthquakes, but the tectonic plates will be ripped apart and mountains will heave up and split apart. And islands will slide along the mantle of the earth, the liquefied outer crust, and land masses will crash into each other. It will be a terrifying time. And this is when, when mountains split apart. This might be when the Mount of Olives splits apart. A stronghold for the people of Israel. Israel should not fear, for behold, he cometh. 
Isaiah 26 says, Come, my people, into your chambers and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. And here Nahum 17, Nahum 1, 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. Knowingjesus.com So the enemy nations of the world will be destroyed at Armageddon. Revelation 16 says, For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon, where Satan and his armies are utterly defeated. And the scavengers will eat the flesh of the losers. The Assyrian and the Babylonian armies both try to defeat the Israelites and they no longer exist, while the Jewish nation of Israel prevails. Similarly, the armies of the world at Armageddon will no longer exist. With God's help, Israel will prevail. Zion will be a mountain of delight where God's people will be safe. Jesus the Messiah is a shelter and a stronghold for his people. Isn't that glorious? Oh dear, got an extra page here for nothing. End of episode 6, chapter 3a, Judgment of the Nations. Here Jesus is judging the nations at the end time. Uh, weighing them in the balance. And the Psalm 9 says, Rise up, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your presence. So that's the end of episode 6, chapter 3a, the first part. And today the scripture we should be most alert to with respect to modern Israel is Genesis 12. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, Israel. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So like it or not, Israel is an anointed nation. And when we partner with them, we share in the bounty of God. So thank you for spending this time with me. Please follow me to episode 7 for the rest of chapter 3 of Joel. God bless you. Shalom.